Okay, so welcome to our Camino Wildlife Habitat program, the third Wednesday of the month. Before we learn about mushrooms from Scott, let me tell you a little bit about our project because um, that's why we do these programs, so we can spread the news about creating an island in harmony with nature one yard at a time. So Kameno is a certified wildlife habitat community, and we do that by certifying people's backyards through the National Wildlife Federation's um, Certified Wildlife Habitat Pro Program. And so you can see that there we've lost a lot of habitat um, between 1984 and 2020. So the goal is that we can maybe link corridors, a link corridors with the parks with through our yards if people are doing things in their yards that um, connect. So Russell Link, he's a fish and wildlife biologist with the state who lives on Whitby and he wrote a book called Living with Wildlife and Landscaping for Wildlife and in that he talks about zones, area one, area two, and area three. Area one being close to the house and that's kind of might be where you put your bird feeders so you can look around and, and learn the birds. Then area two, it's a little less traveled area, and area threes are parts of the yard that you may not go to very often. And so those area three parts of our yards can link up and restore corridors. And that's why we're doing this project. It's our action step. So rather than sobbing about the loss of habitat, we are trying to um, spread the news about keeping uh, the native plants and, and the wildness on the island rather than ripping it up and having five acres of lawn. So you can um, you can do it in stages if you want to have a wildlife habitat. So like when we moved to the island in 94, there was um, grass in the front. We live on the bottom of the hill um, and our garage is at the top. So all this above the hill is above our house and, and we have a slope. Okay, so we, um, didn't just turn it into a wildlife habitat right away, we did it in stages. So the bottom picture here is what we, um, when we did the left side of the yard and then we did the right side. So when you're landscaping for wildlife, you can think of it as a work in progress that's really never complete, but now we have layers. So we have our ground cover, we have shrubs and we have the trees and that, fills the various niches of um, what the critters need. So right now, you know, we have a lot of wildlife there, but lots of times I don't even see it. And, and I can tell you on the neighbors have grass on both sides of ours, and there it's just dry brown grass. And um, our yard is, is lush and pleasant and, and green and a bit of an oasis for us as well as the wildlife. So you can provide for wildlife by providing the basics, food, water, shelter, and places to raise young, and also practicing responsible gardening. So we live on an island that we get our water from the ground. And so what we do not only affects the wildlife, but it also affects what we're, what we're drinking and what we're what going into our systems as well. So reducing lawn, growing natives, conserving water, which is really a big thing when we only have our groundwater, um, eliminating, reducing pesticide use. All this is stuff that, um, you know, you don't have to be perfect when you start, but perhaps um, as you go into um, landscaping for wildlife, you start to think about what you're doing in your yard a little bit more and, and how it's affecting um, the wildlife and how it's affecting what goes into the water as well. So it's simple to do. There's an application that you get from the National Wildlife Federation. We have applications on the website and this application that you can get off the website comes to us so that we can count it. We now have 1,014 certified habitats on the island. We're working on 1,100 now. And it's a simple check off of how you're providing the food, water, shelter, <coughs> raise young and responsible gardening techniques. So there's a $20 fee and with that you'll get the National Wildlife Magazine for a year and then you'll always be a um, national a wildlife certified area property as long as you're living on it. But if you want to continue getting the magazine and being a National Wildlife Federation, then you would give annual um, donations. But the certifying is $20 and you get their magazine for a year, but you're certified as long as you're living there. Uh, you can also go to the National Wildlife Federation directly to their website, nwf.org, and certify online. And with that, you can um, kind of 
let people know. And when you let people know that you're <laughs> a wildlife habitat by having these signs up, then I get calls and people say, well, I can be a certified wildlife habitat. What do I need to do? So it's great advertising for the project. It's also a way to kind of uh, show that your yard may be a little messier than a perfectly manicured lawn um, because it's a wildlife habitat and it's a purposeful um, yard and landscaping because you're you're doing things for the critters. So you leave seeds on and you don't prune as prune things off and, and um, you just let things kind of be. I know the ocean spray, which I think is a beautiful plant, it, um, it looks a little messy once the blossoms kind of dry up, but chickadees will hop all over that and, and feed on it. So it's a real good habitat um, bush for wildlife. And, um, and it's just exquisite in June. So on the island, I, I mentioned we have 1,014 certified wildlife habitats, dots all around the island and next to the parks and around. So we're, we're establishing some, reestablishing some corridors and, um, and we're looking to add more dots. So the community wildlife habitats are a bit of an action step for a lot of communities. In Washington, there's 18. We were the second, Tukwila was the first, and we were the 10th in the state to certify and there are now 148 communities in um, in the nation, and we were the 10th. And for more information, the National Wildlife Federation website is full of various things, including native plant lists and such that are regionally um, noted. And then our website, and Roxy's done a fabulous job with our website. You can go and look at our old programs you can see the uh, our native plant list that works for our community and shows how you can grow various plants thinking about layering so understory plants ground covers trees and and that's there and a lot of different things and it has our number one recording of scott who's our speaker tonight doing um, how to landscape drain fields He's a bit of a rock star with that presentation, our first Zoom that we did on our own. So thanks to Scott, he's coming back tonight and I will introduce you momentarily. And these are the two books I noted at the top, Living with Wildlife, Landscaping for Wildlife. They're nice because they're about the Pacific Northwest specifically. And then the National Wildlife Federation does a book as well. And Val, where can we visit your booth this Saturday? I, I'm getting there, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the bit about the Camino Island Backyard Wildlife Project. And then let me give you a little bit more information. We do third Wednesday of the month programs and that will be October 19th. And in October, we'll have a, uh, John Farnsworth will be talking about the osprey nest in the Swinomish Valley and um, life on a cell tower. So we'll learn about ospreys and their nests. And then um, this Saturday is Camino 101. And so that's where you can learn how to live on an island. So Backyard Wildlife will be there if you want to certify as a wildlife habitat or you want to get a sign. If you are already certified, I just need to know your number in order to know that you're truly certified so that you can get a sign. And, um, and Scott will be there. He's the guy that is coordinating it, the co-coordinator of the thing, and um, the Washington Parks will be there, Friends of Kamen Island Parks will be there, the Snohomish Conservation District will be there. So it's kind of like living on an island is a little bit different than living in the city. And so this is of various groups that will show people how to live on the island. It's at the Kameno Center on Arrowhead, and it will be so not the multi-purpose center where we normally have our programs, but the, the senior center on Arrowhead. And it will be from one until four on Saturday afternoon. And with that, I am ready to introduce Scott. And so I will get rid of my program and tell you about Scott. Scott is a, um, a volunteer uh, extraordinaire. He is, he's coordinating Kamena 101. He, um, he used to said my title should be Sound Water Stewards Volunteer, but that's not giving him justice. He used, he's a beach watcher from the very first class on the island that's now Sound Water Stewards. He then became the Washington State um, Extension Coordinator for Camino Island that helped with waste wise and, um, 
and and a master gardener did you do things with that and uh no the the current the current person in that position does <clears throat> but i also volunteer for Kama beach foundation island uh island county marine resource committee and the um lighthouse environmental programs okay and he got the snohomish conservation district um lifetime achievement award three or four years ago so we're um and and he's that rock star with his drain fields um <laughs> drain fields recording that you can go and watch and learn about how to landscape on your drain field that's had more than a thousand views and he's even been in a national magazine about it pumper magazine <laughs> for septic systems and so with that, let me introduce you and welcome, Scott. This is Scott Chase and welcome. Thank you for doing another program for us. Thank you. You might think it's too dry out to have mushrooms growing, but these oyster mushrooms that I have here, I will uh, be featuring uh, a story about those here and there within the uh, presentation. So I'm going to just want to say that I'm not a scientist, I'm not a mycologist, I'm a hobbyist, a mushroom hobbyist. My wife and I bought our property on Kameno uh, forest land uh, back in the 1990s and walking around, we saw mushrooms growing everywhere and, and our question was, I wonder if we can eat these? We had no idea. At the time we lived in Seattle, we lived um, just maybe half a mile from where the largest mycological society in the state, Puget Sound Mycological Society, uh, in fact, I have a t-shirt with them on there. Anyway, uh, we lived about half a mile from their meetings so we could walk on down to the meetings once a month and uh, learn all, take classes and learn all about mushrooms and found out that sure enough, a lot of what we had on our land was edible. Um, from that, we moved to Camino in 2000 and, uh, um, we ended up also joining the uh, Snohomish Mycological Society, which is in Everett. So I'm going to switch to my screen if I can. Mysteries of Mushrooms. Can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's good, but we want to watch the video. Yeah, there we go. So um, you can see that. Good. So this is, uh, you'll see this slide again inside the thing because that's uh, uh, spores of uh, mushroom coming on down and blowing in the wind, but I'll go from that. So your interest in mushrooms possibly came from when you were a kid and you uh, might've had books that had mushrooms in there, um, especially that how and why book. I, I know a lot of us probably, that was our introduction to science was how and why. Um, but there are a great number of books, especially fairy tales that had mushrooms in them. Possibly it was from movies that you saw. Uh, obviously anything with Alice in Wonderland and it had mushrooms. Uh, the hobbits, you know, there are scenes where they were eating mushrooms. And lower right-hand corner, that's from Journey to the Center of the Earth, my favorite 1959 uh, movie based on the J Jules Verne novel. Um, Maybe it was some party you went to went back in the 60s. And there were all sorts of mushrooms there, just not ones uh, uh, that I'm going to talk about tonight. You might own something or might have owned something in the 70s. If you remember, mushrooms were everywhere. You would find them on cookie jars. You'd find them on coffee mugs. You would find them on salt and pepper shakers, hanging on people's walls, decorating their cars everywhere you happen to find mushrooms. A lot of those have disappeared by the wayside or ended up in thrift shops or the dump since then. Uh, you still find them occasionally, but that doesn't mean that the interest has gone away. I just found out last week that there's a shop up on Capitol Hill in, in uh, Seattle called Spore Lust, where they sell all mushroom related uh, t-shirts and, and other things that are uh, mushroom centered. I haven't been there, I just heard about it. I don't know if I will go down there, but it was just interesting that there was enough interest for somebody to open a store and that's all they sell. So one thing we wanna know, or you wanna know, if wild mushrooms are safe to eat. As it says there, we cook, not sure, take to lab. 
and there's a lab in that rock back there behind them. Uh, I'm having a hard time reading the top of these slides because of things that are on there, but anyway, sorry. Um, so these mushrooms here, most of the mushrooms that we get are in the store. And usually you'll find a few exotic ones, maybe an oyster mu mushrooms or shiitake. Uh, you might find in-season morels or chanterelles. But for the most part, these are the three that you end up finding and buying. You have your white button mushrooms, you have your brown cremini mushrooms, and you have your portobello mushrooms. And the question you might have is, what do these all have in common? Well, basically, they're the same species. They're Agaricus bisporus. Why is one white? Why is one brown? Why are some people white and some people brown? Or your dogs or anything else in nature? Uh, there are all sorts of colors. And uh, with mushrooms, you know, for that kind, it's white or brown. Portobellos are just the creamini ones or the brown ones that have been allowed to get older and larger. In fact, for the white ones, you might remember years ago, you used to, you used to be able to buy what they call stuffing mushrooms, which is just a big white mushroom that had the uh, um, center part taken out so you could put all sorts of goodies in there. But they're the same mushroom. And the marketing of those, I notice usually now the button ones and the cremini ones, they cost the same amount per pound. But for a while, the cremini ones were like a dollar more. And uh, sometimes they'd fancy up the names. And uh, I know that I've seen the white ones packaged in, in one of those shrink wrap packages, and they're calling them baby Bella mushrooms. Well, no, they weren't. They're just the same white mushrooms you can buy by the pound. Uh, when you do buy mushrooms in the store, what I do want to advise is you don't get one of the plastic uh, bags that you put your other produce in. Uh, usually, not always, but usually you'll find small paper bags uh, near the mushrooms there and grab one of those, put them in there because they're allowed to breathe. The plastic bags, they end up uh, getting a little bit slimy or, or uh, it's just not good having something that they can breathe in. What I brought the ones in today uh, is a mesh produce bag, and that allows everything to breathe well uh, inside the refrigerator. Other ways mushrooms are sold. Well, you might find them like at the bottom of the farmer's market, um, a variety of them in season. Um, many of our mothers ended up uh, getting the mushrooms in a can like the one up in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, you can buy ones in the store that are uh, packaged and dried, like the dried porcini ones they have in the upper right-hand corner. So whether they're toxic or not, well, a lot of the food that we eat is toxic in some forms. A lot of us are allergic to things, um, but we've learned how to safely handle them. Chicken, like in the upper left-hand corner, uh, we know not to wash those in the sink and, and get the stuff spread all over the place because uh, it can be toxic. The pork in the upper right-hand corner, I know my mother was deathly afraid of, afraid of uh, pork in any form that uh, had pink to it. Now I guess pink is okay, but she was afraid. Uh, raw hamburger, uh, raw eggs, anything like that. Uh, we've learned to cope with it. We learned to cook them. We learned to watch what we eat. There are, uh, one thing I read, there are 140 different foods, uh, common foods that are allergens that people are allergic to. Could be peanuts, could be soy, could be wheat. I'm allergic to soy. Um, could be dairy. We all if don't have that allergen. We know people who do. And so we know how to avoid them. Upper right-hand corner is a warning uh, that you can find on menus when you go to a restaurant, uh, warning you against ordering anything that isn't fully cooked. Lower left-hand corner, uh, most of our packages have little box in there telling whether they have wheat or soy or egg or milk or tree nuts or anything like that that might make some people sick. And again, you know, chicken, um, getting raw chicken on your hands is far more dangerous than picking a wild mushroom, even a poisonous one, and, and having that uh, get into your mouth in some way or other. Shellfish. Um, being in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of us go on down and dig for clams or mussels or, or order them up in the stores or 
in the restaurants. And uh, there are times um, where the shellfish have, are toxic and can kill you or paralyze you or make you really sick. And you'll see the signs posted there. And uh, a lot of us, before we go out and dig for any shellfish like that, we'll check the uh, shellfish hotline to make sure that it's safe uh, to harvest them wherever we happen to be going. There's an example of a sign there. Uh, hours after that sign is taken down, you'll see people out there with their shovels digging up the shellfish. We've just learned to live with the danger and now and know how to avoid getting sick. So now we're gonna look at some of the science around mushrooms. That gentleman right there, um, I don't know if you can see on his uh, jacket there, but his name is Paul Stamets. He owns a company down in the lower Puget Sound called Fungi Perfecti. And you can actually uh, order up their catalog. If you go online and look up Fungi Perfecti, you'll find uh, the company and you can order, uh, which I'll get into later, uh, products where you can grow your own mushrooms. Um, you can go online, uh, Google his name, Go to YouTube, you'll find TED Talks and other talks that he's given about mushrooms that are excellent. He's written several books on mushrooms, um, medicinal ones, psychedelic ones, uh, um, ones touting all their great properties that they have. Uh, he's just an amazing person and uh, has a great way of presenting all of that. A cool fact, uh, some of the oldest uh, fungi are 350 million year old uh, prototypes that they have found um, in, uh, I think that was in the Middle East somewhere. It was a fossil. And uh, there's an example, the guy in the left hand there, he's holding up a sample from it. And by doing examination, discovered that it was a fungus. At the very bottom, there's an artist's rendition of what they imagine that it might've looked like. Um, back when. So this describes the six kingdoms. Mushrooms, even though you can find them in the produce section of the store, they are not vegetables, they are fungi. And you've heard that and you probably know that. You have plants, animals, fungi, and then you have other kingdoms of life too. Uh, something, if you look at that online, you'll find five kingdoms of life. This one's six kingdoms of life. You can discover seven kingdoms of life. So uh, there are a varied number out there, but uh, um, they are their own kingdom. So here's a typical life style, or life cycle, I should say, of a mushroom. You end up having a typical type mushroom on the, on the left there. They have their cap and they have their stem and they have the base and the gills uh, or pores or teeth underneath. And uh, um, the spores will end up uh, leaving the mushroom in a variety of ways, which I'll go through. When they find a suitable place to, to germinate, they'll start germinating, turn into what they call hyphae. Uh, the hyphae end up growing into long streams, strings of what they call mycelium. Mycelium will end up uh, forming little tiny mushrooms, and then you end up with the mature mushroom. And that's their cycle of life, or typical. So how are spores spread? Gravity is the main way. Uh, the ones that uh, spread by gravity, they're called basidiomycetes. And uh, there's a typical mushroom right there. Underneath, again, as I mentioned, there could be gills, there could be tubes, there could be spores. Anyway, you look at it, um, they drop their spores and they get blown around in the wind and land somewhere. How small are the spores? Well, you can fit 25,000 approximately on the head of a pin. And a typical mushroom over its lifespan can produce billions of spores. And yes, you are breathing some in probably right now. They're throughout, throughout the atmosphere uh, and everywhere around the earth. There's the example from the very first slide there showing some of them um, wafting out in the wind. It's kind of cool looking but science fiction. So how do you identify mushrooms? One way is through spore prints. There are other things I'll mention too. Uh, and there's an example of a spore print I did just a few days ago using a primini mushroom that had, uh, I waited until 
it had spread out a bit and the um, veil that's underneath the mushroom had disappeared. Uh, set it down on a piece of paper, put a cup over it, left, left it for a, a day, and that's what it looks like. Another way spores are spread, uh, discharge, they're called ascomycetes. And if you're not familiar with this, this is the uh, morel, which is a highly prized mushroom you can find in the, in the uh, Northwest and around the rest of the world. And for those that don't have any gills underneath, they have um, kind of a pressure system and it shoots the spores out. One example of this method of uh, distributing the spores is also the puffball. How many of you as a kid probably went around stomping on these if you found them in a the field just because it was so cool to watch the, what you thought might have been smoke or something like that shooting off into the air? Other ways they're spread. Um, this is one example of flicker or, or a woodpecker might go to a tree to find some bugs to eat and a tree might be colonized by fungi, by uh, um, mycelium and uh, might be rotting and the um, flicker or woodpecker will peck away at it, getting the bugs. They'll fly to another tree, peck away at that tree. And in that way, they've taken the spores from the one and spread them to the other. There is a tree, I showed you all those oyster mushrooms. There's a tree, oh, this photo is probably 10 years ago that I took uh, in our backyard. And these are a number of uh, oyster mushrooms growing out of the tree. As you can see the gills underneath, uh, the spores would uh, fall down to lower parts of the tree and uh, end up spreading out through the tree. And they might not be the only um, mushroom that might do the same thing in that tree. I'll show you some others later. Another way they're spread underground ones, like tropples that you're familiar with, which are also here in the Pacific Northwest, they might end up being eaten by a flying squirrel or other rodent. And uh, it's really a favorite of theirs. And uh, they might get picked up by an owl or someone and, and taken off to another tree where, where the uh, uh, their scat will end up containing the mushroom spores and end up spreading, uh, or just the rodent themselves might end up going somewhere else in the forest and uh, um, their scat will end up having the spores in them. So, so what happens once a spore finds a great place to grow? I told you how tiny they are. This is obviously a really highly magnified example of a spore. They end up uh, becoming hyphae like a long string there, with different cells, and they it's a modular growth, and then they end up uh, growing and forming what they call mycelium, which is the body of the fungus. So the mycelium is underneath the earth, and it will grow up. Uh, what you see as a mushroom is a fruiting body of mycelium, but it is mycelium also. Um, you've seen mycelium, might not have realized it. Uh, in turning over your compost pile, you see this fine. Uh, spider web looking type stuff that's white uh, might look like that. That's an example of mycelium right there. There's a cool photo. <laughs> anyway, um, so because mycelium's under the earth, how many fungal individuals are there? There's one. It's underneath the earth. It started off right in the middle of there. There was a mushroom, and that mushroom ended up depleting the uh, nutrients in the soil around it. And then the next year, there was a little circle of mushrooms around that one. They ended up depleting the circle. It went on and on and on from there, growing out further. A mycelial mass like this is actually one of the largest living things on the earth. Uh, in the Mathur forest down in Oregon, there's uh, one that's four square miles in size, about the size of 1,665 football fields, and uh, they estimate it to be around 8,000 years old. Um, the way that they discovered that is that the forest, the trees ended up, uh, some of them ended up dying off, and, and from the air they could see that it was in a circle. And it was the same thing as right here. Uh, the mushrooms, honey mushrooms had ended up killing off some of the trees, um, and 
ended up spreading out further, spreading out further, spreading out further to the size that I just mentioned to you. So three ways that the fungi obtain energy. They're parasitic fungi that require a living host to survive stealing food from the host. And that might be a plant, might even be a animal. I mean, there are different insects uh, that have mushrooms growing out of them because they've been infected. They're saprophytic, sap, saprophytic fungi that break down dead organism matter and recycling the nutri nutrients. That's like uh, the leaves in your compost pile. Then there are mycorrhizal fungi that have a symbiotic relationship between the mycelium and the roots of host plants. And that's the most fascinating one uh, in the forest ecosystem. So what do they eat? They're decomposers. They break down the molecules and the sugars or consume the sugars in the environment. A shelf fungi that you will find on logs could be common bread mold that we've all had at one time or another. What but but mushrooms in the store that might be grown on dung or compost. <clears throat> and why they're friends of our forest is because if it wasn't for the mushrooms, we'd have piles and piles of dead trees and limbs and everything else growing around. They end up breaking everything down and uh, turning it into compost. Or a handful of years ago on my back stairs, uh, We've obviously had, we've all had stairs or something at one time or another, it felt a little bit squishy under our feet and I pulled up the top stairs and that's what I had growing underneath. So Luke Perry, the, the TV star, he died a few years ago, 2019, and he ended up getting buried in something called a mushroom burial suit. And uh, uh, this one right here, the woman uh, has a, YouTube video on it uh, of her giving a TED talk and showing how these uh, mushroom burial suits work. You put on the uh, suit, which is, or somebody puts it on you, uh, which is full of mycelium and you're buried in, in the earth and uh, eventually they'll grow into mycelium and mushrooms and will end up decomposing your body and taking your nutrients and passing it on to the trees around you. Here at Lens Enterprises in Stanwood is an example of fungi that have uh, taken over a big pile of compost there. I took this photo years ago during a WSU Waste Wise field trip uh, to um, Lens Enterprises. I just thought it was kind of fascinating. Growing mushrooms in compost. I mentioned the compost and this one way that they do it commercially, uh, or you can do it at home. There's home cultivation kits that you can get and uh, um, grow your own mushrooms. There's an example right there. There are mushroom shows that they have around. Um, and I will give you some information on those. And at the shows, uh, here's two bags that I bought at one of the shows. The one on the left, well, they're just like plastic bags that are full of uh, uh, straw or something that have been inoculated with the uh, mycelium. and you punch some holes in it, mist it a little bit with a hand mister, and mushrooms will grow out of them. The ones on the left, they're oyster mushrooms. The ones on the right are shiitake mushrooms. And it's, my hand is down there in the bottom one just to show an example of the size of uh, what you get. Another thing you can do is that through Fungi Perfecti or other companies around, you can buy these plugs. These are the wood dowel plugs that you get for furniture making, and you see they have white on them. That's because they're inoculated with the spores too. And you can go and take and drill holes in relatively fresh limbs of like an alder or a maple. Uh, this is what 2013, it's my former boss's house, uh, boss with WSU Extension. He had a party where we could all chip in and buy a bunch of the plugs and plug different ones. He cut the limbs. You wanna get limbs that are probably less than two weeks old uh, or two weeks cut from the tree. The reason for that is, is that after that, just wild spores that are floating through the air can end up uh, taking over. Uh, we were all out there. We brought our drills and hammer and drilling holes and uh, hammering those plugs into the logs. Um, my former boss also 
raise bees, so he had a bunch of wax. So we took, when we were all done, we took bees wax and we uh, sealed the tops there. So other fungi spores or other contaminants couldn't get in and interrupt with uh, what we were doing. So here's an example of, of some limbs that have had shiitake mushrooms growing out of them. In fact, that's the way that they grow them in, in Japan and some other countries. <clears throat> so mycorrhizal relationships are the relationship between the fungus and the root of a tree or plant. Um, you get the fungus, you get the soil, you get the plant. And what they do is that once a plant, a seedling ends up getting a, a, some a mycelium on it, they end up expanding through the soil. You see a good example on the right hand side where they've expanded quite a bit. That allows the seedling to get nutrients and moisture from the soil, even during drought times, uh, because it goes down, can go down several inches and uh, um, take up new, um, moisture from the dirt below. The size of it, well, you can see the hyphae are smaller than plant roots. Uh, they're about one five hundredth the diameter of one of the hairs on the end of a plant root. They're so small that underneath your foot, when you're walking outside um, on the lawn or anything like that, you could have miles of these uh, uh, hyphae mycelium uh, underneath your foot. There's an example of how small it is. There's an example of what it looks like. Um, again, if you see that white dusty looking stuff, that's mycelium. So what do they do? Um, trees, plants are green. Um, they end up uh, having photosynthesis where they can take the uh, light from the sun and turn it into uh, energy, which they share with the plants. Because at the base of the tree roots and the plant roots, you have the mycelium, uh, as you saw in the pictures before, and uh, um, they don't, they aren't green. They don't get photosynthesis, so they get a lot of their energy through their association with the trees and the plants. And uh, they end up getting uh, sugar and carbon from the trees. They end up giving back to the trees. They give nutrients and water. Uh, so it's a symbiotic relationship. There's an example of a couple of the seedlings where the uh, mycelium has grown so large that they're uh, interacting with each other. Now you have something called parenting, where if you went to somewhere like the uh, Olympic National Forest, there are parts of the forest, if you walk through, it's dark. Because it's dark, the little tiny seedlings down below on the ground, little trees, they're not able to get any uh, sunlight or enough sunlight to do their own photosynthesis. And so their roots are intertwining with the large, huge old growth trees uh, around them. And the old growth trees end up sending down um, energy nutrients and such to the uh, little seedlings and that helps them um, survive and grow. And that's what they call parenting. So here again is that Paul Stamets that I mentioned. He, uh, he's written several books. One I would recommend reading to re see all the uh, fascinating things that mushrooms can do or fungi can do is mycelium running um, or how mushrooms can save the world. Uh, you can buy it in the bookstores, you can find it in the library, uh, but it's worth looking through. It's a lot of fun. So Paul Stamets, there's somebody else named Paul Stamets. If any of you ever watched Star Trek, they have in the newer series Discovery, Lieutenant Commander Paul Stamets, Chief Engineer. That's no mistake. It, one of the premises in the, in the new series is that I mentioned to you how spores spread everywhere. The premise is that the spores are spread throughout the entire universe. And so they have a uh, hyperdrive in their spaceship that uses a mycelial um, drive. And so there you have the mycelium drive in the upper left-hand corner. You can see on the uh, one there in the upper right-hand corner, he pushes spore drive and uh, they go into whatever they can, they can travel to any of the spores throughout the universe. Starting off like that and end up wherever they wanna go like that. It's fun, it's silly. They had it the first three year, years of the season. I don't think they have that anymore. So identifying new mushrooms. 
Oh, there's me with uh, uh, some of the trees in our backyard there years ago. On the left-hand side, that one tree has the oyster mushrooms, same tree in the fall, uh, has some other mushrooms growing in kind of the same place. In order to identify them, uh, a lot of the books you can get have what they call keys. They also have other guides and you can find them online. And it's one of the things where if the mushroom looks like this, then go to there. If it looks like this, go to there. And you just end up following the keys. This is a very simple one, but they can get a lot more complex. And one of the books I have, I'll show you the picture of, that one has hundreds of pages that have keys in them. So you can make sure absolutely what the mushroom is. So one of the things that you need to know um, for a mushroom is a spore print, what color it is. And uh, one way to do that is take a mushroom, uh, put it upside down on a piece of paper and leave it overnight. And uh, there you can see what color the spore print is. That one's sort of a dark cinnamon uh, brown. Other ones can be white, um, yellow. There are all sorts of different colors that they can be, but it's an essential way of telling what the mushroom is and identifying it. Other ones include the stem, uh, whether it's hollow or, or hard and brittle, um, the, the size of the uh, cap, how it attaches to the stem, uh, the vulva or what's at the bottom of it, uh, the type of gills it has, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, odor, that all has something to play with it. And so you have to absolutely identify um, to be sure unless you're no otherwise. There's uh, that same tree that I showed you during the storm last winter, uh, a big part of it came on down and smashed up the garden shed that I have and also uh, cratered the roof of a 1987 Volkswagen Vanagon that I had that I planned to sell in the spring. So, uh, but the, the chunks of it that I had cut off with a saw and threw behind the garage are right now sprouting oyster mushrooms. So I'll keep them around for a while. There are Facebook groups in order to identify. Um, there are quite a few. If you just look up online, if you look on Facebook, look up uh, mushroom identification groups. Uh, look for ones that have Pacific Northwest in them because uh, what you find in other parts of the country isn't really important. That's what you find around here. There are also apps that you can put on your phone. One of them's iNaturalist, and you can use that not only to identify mushrooms, but you can use that app to uh, be able to identify animals and birds and plants and trees and everything else. Take a picture and it helps you identify them. Um, here's the fun part. I told you, you might have read that there are interesting things you can do with spore prints. Obviously a white spore print isn't going to show up on a white piece of paper. So you need a colored piece of paper. And so there's an example right there. I have that those oyster mushroom parts. I put those, uh, on some colored pieces of paper. There's some regular cremini mushrooms on the right-hand side. I waited until they were large enough to where um, you could remove the stem in the middle and have uh, the gills exposed. Placed them about on the pieces of paper, put covers on them. One has a salad bowl, one has a corral dish on top of it. Left them 24 hours, took them off. And here are different spore prints that you see. Now you can get creative with those, you can do two or three different ones and overlap them, make designs that way. You can get pieces of fern and put them in some uh, paint or, or dye or something and lay those down on, on them and uh, make different patterns. Uh, but when you see them up close, you can really see the close up. You can see uh, uh, how fascinating it is, how many spores there are on each one. Whoops, let me see. The black ones, they especially show up all the spores there. Uh, and again, those wouldn't show up at all if you had them on white paper. So there are lo local mushroom shows that go on. One thing, if you are out there going out there to hunt for mushrooms, uh, you should go with somebody that knows what they're looking for. Um, you should carry the 10 hiking essentials with you if you're going out into unfamiliar woods, because you're looking at your feet and after a while and you could look up and go, where am I? I've done that before. It's not fun, um, but do go out with somebody that knows what they're doing or join a mycological society. They have the uh, uh, Puget Sound Mycological Society uh, based in Seattle. They have 
uh, one that's based in, in Everett. Uh, they have another one based in Bellingham. Although if you live in Camano or nearby, it's a bit of a drive. Um, it is worth knowing. Uh, the mycological societies have people that can help you identify things. They can show you how to cook things. You can take classes. Um, you can go on what they call forays. And forays is like a field trip where you join other people in the group and you go off to different places where it's known that you're gonna find uh, some type of mushroom. Like it might be in the fall coming up where you're looking for chanterelles and they'll take you to some place that uh, has been good for finding chanterelles uh, throughout the last number of years. The mushroom shows, uh, they're usually, well, they're always toward the end of October. This one, the biggie, the Puget Sound Mycological Society one, is at Shoreline Community College, uh, October 22nd and October 23rd. Uh, I think their show costs $10, but it's huge and you learn a lot and you can see a lot. Um, they have another one in Everett uh, in October 23rd. So you can go to this one on the 22nd and this one on the 23rd. This one's free, the Snow Snohomish County Mycological Society. And uh, um, let me see, somehow I cut out where it is. Sorry about that. It's at, uh, huh, it went off my side. It's at uh, Floral Hall in Muckleteo. But if you look up Snohomish County Mycological Society, go to their website, you'll be able to find out the details on it. It just didn't have a fancy poster like the other one. So mushrooms that you'll find around, well, I'm on Camino Island. I don't know where you are, but these are also found around uh, uh, the rest of the Northwest. Uh, on our road, going down the road, there's a shaggy mane. Some of you may have seen this, Coprinus commodus. It's an edible mushroom. You should cook it within uh, not too long a period after you pick it, maybe even hours, um, because it starts to deteriorate shortly after you pick it. There's one, uh, morels, um, on the left-hand side. In my yard, I get a few in the spring, but they're pretty tiny. The one on the right-hand side, uh, a volunteer that I knew with Beach Watchers, he was helping a neighbor by, an elderly neighbor by mowing around his yard and around the apple trees, he found those great big, huge giant morels. And he brought them to me and he said, I don't like mushrooms. I said, you want these? Well, <laughs> of course I did. Um, and I reciprocated in kind. But uh, morel, one nice thing about morels is, is one of those that uh, is not easily confused with another one. There are a couple of things that look like a morel, but uh, again, if you go uh, with somebody that knows what they're looking for, you'll get the real thing. And those can be strung up on string and hung up somewhere dry, and uh, they dry out within a few days usually. Chanterelles. This is a group of uh, um, WSU beach watchers uh, from Camano Island. This is a number of years ago. And uh, uh, some. this was, uh, let me see, it was off a road called French Creek, mile post 41, um, sort of near Darrington. Um, you can't get there anymore. My wife and I went there a couple of years ago and we drove up the road to it and the entry to this road uh, the lumber country, uh, forest, anyway, the lumber company that, that uh, um, owned it had ended up covering the road with, with stumps and brush and uh, everything else they could find up to 15 feet high in both sides of the road. So there was absolutely no way of getting to the area where we found those great mushrooms. The other problem was, is that the road had deteriorated to the point where there were huge, huge potholes. And we were going like five miles an hour all the way up several miles trying to uh, uh, avoid every single pothole. So it wasn't worth it. We sometimes also go on to the Mountain Loop Highway and there are certain areas where we know where we can find them out there. For chanterelles, you wanna go, we usually look for after the second good downpour of, of rain in the fall and uh, um, where you find them is usually under uh, firs and, and cedars and such, and uh, large ones, the old growth ones or second growth ones. Um, 
look in the moss, look for the damp areas, not a dry area. And uh, they're not easy, they're a couple of lookalikes, but they're not easily confused with something else. And they have a distinctive odor. Um, here's some that are a little older than the first one I showed. And where you find them, um, again, in the duff, in the moss, here's my wife's hand right there. You can see the obvious one sticking up on the left-hand side, but where you find one, you're gonna find others. So if you look underneath her hand, you can see, barely see one hidden down there underneath the moss. Here's my friend, Barbara Brock, and she had a basket full of, uh, handful of chanterelles, but she also had this orange one. What the orange one, British orange one is, is what they call a lobster mushroom. And that one, uh, again, not easily confused with something else. It smells like lobster, tastes like lobster. However, when it gets old and past its prime, it smells like old lobster and it tastes like old lobster. So <laughs> you wanna eat it when it's in its prime. Here, puffballs, um, we're all familiar with those. And when they're younger, which I don't have a shot of there, they can be edible, but there are things that can be confused with them. So I would not recommend it. Uh, oyster mushrooms, which you've seen in my hand and on the tree, they're not easily confused with anything. They grow usually on alders and uh, maples and uh, other hardwoods around. And uh, again, they're not easily confused with something else. There's a colander there that I had that was just full of nice and fresh. Now there's something that looks like a like a uh, oyster mushroom, and it's called angel wings, Pleurotus origins. The the oyster mushroom is called Pleuro Pleurotus ostriatus. These are Pleurotus origins. They grow in the same areas. They look kind of like an oyster mushroom, but they're bright white and uh, you can see light through them. And in either case, uh, well, like the first, in any case, you know, cooking them, it's kind of fun. Uh, we usually cook them in like butter and wine and add those to a pasta. Shaggy paracels, Lepiota racoides, these grow all over Camino. Um, they're fairly good size. I mean, they're, they can be like the size of a saucer or even get to the size of a dinner plate. But the problem is with any mushrooms, when they get too large, uh, bugs start infiltrating them too. So you wanna look for little pinholes where there might be little worms or, or bugs that are underneath. So you kind of avoid the really large ones. Agaricus Augustus called the prince. That's sort of the big prize one. If you happen to find one, they're absolutely delicious. Um, Agaricus, Augustus, now Agaricus by Sporus is the button mushroom or the other ones I showed you. This one grows a lot larger, has a distinct odor. Again, the one that the size of the guy has in his hands right there, uh, good chance they might have bugs in them, but uh, still it's a wonderful one to find. And I've seen them along the roadways on Camino. Truffles in Freeland, um, they're, some that have been found down there. I had a woman contact me, um, asked me about one that she found. She sent me a picture. She asked what I, she should do. And I said, I said, do you have a little box? She said, yeah. I said, well, put them in a little box. Here's my name. Here's my address. Send them to me. And she said, well, what are you going to do with them? I said, have them with dinner. I said, they're delicious. But uh, you can find them too. Um, there are people that go out there with their dogs they've trained. Uh, we're trained to find truffles. You know, you'd hear about pigs and such being used over in Europe, but here you can do it with uh, dogs. There's an article in the Seattle Times and this woman here was featured um, showing and training her dog. She had taken truffle oil and parts of truffles and uh, put them in cotton and containers and uh, let the dog sniff that. There she has some in her hand. Dog goes out with her digging away and uh, ended up finding a fair number of truffles. There are people that used to go and harvest them uh, to sell to restaurants. The law of restaurants got wary because they were getting ones that were too old or too young or uh, other problems with them. So it isn't really a big thing anymore. Slippery Jack, uh, it's a 
type of bolete, they call them. They have little pores underneath. Uh, the top is kind of slimy, which is why they call it slippery. But if you peel, peel it off, um, you've got a good edible there. There's another bolete, the Zeller's bolete. You might have seen these around. They've got kind of a brain matter looking type top and a, a bright red uh, stem there. You can see the uh, slug enjoying one on the upper left hand corner. King boletes, well, these are the prize mushroom. You're not going to find many around uh, Western Washington. Most of them are uh, up in the pine trees, just over the crest of the mountains. Uh, I have heard of them being found here. I've never found any here, but they get to be large and they are delicious. So this one, the uh, cauliflower mushroom, we had them growing uh, at the foot of a bush in our yard um, for a couple of years. And it looked just as large as the one that the guy sitting in the pickup bed there has in his hands. Um, it just appeared out of nowhere. Uh, it kind of has a consistency of, of fresh pasta and uh, just one, I go out there for a couple of weeks and just cut up a big chunk and cook it up. And we'd have that as uh, with our meals. Uh, after the second year, it disappeared and we never saw it again. There's a lobster mushroom like I showed you before. So obviously, wild mushroom can kill you. Here's a poster found uh, uh, in San Francisco, and it has uh, warnings in a lot of different languages. And the reason is, is that uh, a lot of immigrants come over from uh, Asian countries, from Eastern European countries. They find mushrooms growing here that look identical to the ones that they used to pick with their moms and grandmoms for, for generations. And uh, uh, no doubt in their mind that it's the same mushroom until they get really sick or die. So they've had to put out warnings, uh, warning posters just to let people know, you know, be sure that what you're eating. The fly amanita, this is the one that you see in all the books and, and drawings and all that. Uh, and you might have seen them around. Uh, I've seen them around our area. And that one is, well, something that's a prize to uh, reindeer. Reindeer loved eating them up in areas like Siberia and some of the Northern European countries. Um, the um, missionaries and such, when they, when they saw them eating them, they asked the uh, uh, natives why they were why they were walking so funny or jumping so funny. They said, well, because they're flying. And flying is something that you see in a reindeer at, during Christmas time. And if you go to the European, Northern European countries, you'll find that uh, the Ammonitas are a real big deal as far as decorations. We have some Christmas decorations made in Germany that are in the shape of Ammonitas. And uh, you'll see them in, in Christmas cards and, and uh, only see them everywhere that time of year, December. They're just a real big favorite decoration uh, for a lot of the countries. But if you look at the top of it, you'll see those little white spots, little fuzzy type things, which uh, also figure into uh, someone else during the holidays, and that is Santa Claus. And so you got the reindeer there, we're flying. You also have Santa who has a bright red suit. He's got these white tufts uh, along the front of his suit. He's got white trim on his on his collars and his feet. Um, white beard. He looks quite a bit like an Ammonita if you think about it. But also with the white tops, you have Panther Ammonita, which is uh, it's it's poisonous, deadly poisonous. You have the death cap, Ammonita phylloides. And one way to identify all those is at the base, you see it's kind of uh, round, the vulva down there. And uh, they have the uh, dots on top. Uh, there are other ways to tell, but avoid any of the mushrooms that look like that, even the red ones. Although the red ones, some will eat as a hallucinogen. Um, they can also make you really, really sick. Death cap. Ammonite floides, that can kill you. Are they local? This was on our road in 2009. And uh, that's one right there, just not that far from our driveway. 
they've been eaten by a cup something i don't know rodents uh something had eaten parts of it so as far as getting books to identify them um this is kind of the bible of the mushroomers uh mushrooms demystified it's a really thick book it's several hundred pages long by a guy named david aurora it has great photographs uh it has a lot of identifying keys. I'd highly recommend it. Uh, another companion one, it's heavy to take around if you happen to be out in the woods, but they have a companion one called All of the Rain Promises and More, written by the same guy. And uh, uh, sh shows this one guy in the upper right-hand corner with a bunch of matsutake mushrooms in front of them that he had harvested. But uh, they have great keys on the inside um, where you can identify the mushrooms and uh, get a good idea about what you're looking at or thinking about eating. Uh, one thing you'll notice about the following books that I have, they all had the word Northwest in them. There are some beautiful books like Audubon has a beautiful book with, with great photographs of mushrooms, but a lot of them you're not gonna find around here. You might find some other part of North America. You might find it in Manitoba. You might find it in Florida. You might find it in Minnesota, but you might not find it here. So try to find ones uh, that are in the Northwest. I actually, if this were a live uh, presentation, I have a huge stack of different mushroom books and guides. Um, so there are quite a few out there. And again, they do have them in the library. The Mycelium Running, I told you about that one before by Paul Stamets. Mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest by Amirati and, and Trudel there. That one has a bunch of great uh, photographs and identifying uh, keys. Mushrooms in the Northwest. Uh, Again, Northwest, look for that in the title. And at the very end, the last gasp for toadstools. Um, what's it say? Toadstools, something in mushrooms. So anyway, that's a few hundred year old print. And uh, um, I wonder if any of you have any questions. Valor Roxy, can you switch to the people view for questions? Yeah, yeah let's do. Are you will? Do you want to show any more slides? Should we? You think you'll go back? Okay. No. Just we'll just I'm close done. that. Okay. So view the gallery and let's. Um, stop your sharing okay so now we're back so you can um unmute yourself and ask questions so you can type i don't see i'm not muted yeah you're fine okay you can type in the chat have you been finding mushrooms lately scott it's so we've had a really dry summer yeah <laughs> been a very very dry summer as you all know and uh usually well i was surprised uh, about finding those oyster mushrooms to show i mean I, there are shows this time of year where i've been able to come out in a live presentation with a tray of them well these are the only ones that i've seen i mean i have seen some um at the side of the road here and there throughout the summer like the uh highway 532 in in stanwood off to the uh south side of the road they have an area where they've put in a lot of um soil and, and such and for about a week there are just tons of mushrooms growing up there hmm. but i really haven't seen many anywhere else and as far as finding them uh ones like the morels sometimes you can find those in bark when people have bark brought onto their property yeah. um one year we were in in london and we're standing in line at the uh, imperial war museum which is in a former mental hospital that went, goes by the name of bedlam at least it did ah. back then we're standing there and I'm look over to the bark and there were morels everywhere and they were big. We we're trying to convince people to take them home because we were leaving the next day. Oh. Uh, nobody believed this, <laughs> but anyway, uh, still it was impressive to see all those. The only problem, one thing to watch for, uh, if they're by the side of the road, we avoid them. And we also avoid them on bark that's brought in from somewhere because you never know uh, by the side of the road if if any oils or anything else from vehicles going by have okay. leached into the soil and you're picking those up into the mushroom. Wow. Um, 
same thing with bark and things. You never know if something's been sprayed. You don't want to eat right. anything that's been sprayed. So I've seen the the mycelium in bark uh, bark chips, not bark chips, uh, wood chips. Right. Common. So I assume that's good and not bad. Yeah, it helps helps break them down. Okay. Is there any sort of uh, bad mycelium, or is it all good mycelium? You don't know until it grows into a mushroom. Okay. <laughs> I I'm not trying to be wary there. It's just uh. Uh, yeah, no, just, you never know what it is. Yeah, yeah. So we were talking earlier about. Has her hand up for a while here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, so, uh, Penny, you're you're muted. You should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, let me. I can't unmute. There you go. Okay, good. Am I, am I unmuted now? Okay. Yeah, 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 we can hear you. Yeah. No, I just want to say thank you. It was very, very informative. And yeah, now I get to go look for mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> go with somebody that knows what they're looking at. And, and one <laughs> thing to think of, well, one thing to think about when you're doing that is that if you were a hunter, say, you wouldn't go in the forest and shoot every single animal and bring them home and decide hmm. which ones uh, yeah, you're I'm looking for. Same thing with mushrooms. You know, look for some common ones that are readily identifiable, go with somebody that knows what they're looking for. Something like chanterelles or oyster mushrooms or morels or things like that that are uh, not easy to confuse with something else. Because there are some lookalikes uh, on some mushrooms that you can only tell the difference if you happen to have a microscope. So oh, wow. well, yeah, you want something yeah, common. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to come find a group or something to join because I, I know nothing about that. Right. Have, have you so, been seeing them on your property? Oh uh, no, no. I just have a little postage stamp okay. and uh, <laughs> lots of plants, yeah, but no okay. mushrooms. Well, and there are so, a lot of places to go. And Scott, we were talking about that earlier, um, and I just oh. put a link in the chat that you sent me for where to go that we can we can uh -huh. look at state parks. Is that right? Oh yeah, I should have mentioned that. I'm sorry. Um, so as far as where you can go, uh, depending on the land, obviously private land, you don't want to trespass unless you have permission. But other places, um, state parks, Washington state parks, by and large, have a, a policy where you can uh, pick personal use amounts, um, not large commercial amounts. You don't want to go in there with a five gallon bucket. You know, you want to go in there with something <laughs> Big enough to carry for a meal, but talk talk to the main officer, the ranger's office, just to find out. I know the ones in Camino, they're they're good with it because a lot of the rangers themselves go out and pick them for their own dinners. Okay. Um, national uh, parks is forbidden to pick any unless you're a scientist and have the right permits. National forests, that's another matter. Um, there's a chart that I sent to. Uh, um, Roxy, actually, if you go online and uh, Puget Sound Mycological Society, um, if you Google PSMS, uh, I don't know what was on that chart, mushroom harvesting limits or something, they have a chart that shows all the different types of land, uh, Bureau of Land Management land, national forests, national parks, uh, DNR lands, et cetera, et cetera. They all have different policies and different quantities that you can pick under their guidelines. But again, it's always good to either go online and check out that parts website and find out or call their office and determine from there what they allow. Probably the safest to check them because I have had another link that I sent to Scott and my link was from 2016 and his he said this may be old too. So rules change. So be, be safe. Exactly. Uh, you, you don't want to be fined. Question right. about etiquette. Is there an etiquette to um, mushroom hunting, like in birding? Or yeah, something? okay. So as far as etiquette, one thing, um, again, mushrooms spread spores once they become mature. And so you want them to be able to spread spores. If there's something like chanterelles that you're hunting, once you see them of a good size and the spores are exposed, yeah, they've already gone and dropped spores to, to uh, repopulate. However, if, if they're like an inch tall or something and uh, 
uh, size of a Q-tip, you know, if, if they aren't full size, you don't want to pick those. For one thing, it's kind of not worth it to pick one so tiny. For another thing, uh, you want to wait till they've dropped some spores. Part of that, uh, what you want to do now, now, some people say not to ever yank them out of the ground. I've heard different things on that, but usually you want to take a sharp pocket knife uh, and cut them off near the, near the surface, but not below the surface of the ground. Um, one thing uh, as far as carrying them, uh, if you take like a basket with you, I usually take an old fishing creel and put it in there so they can breathe. Um, when you get home, take an old paintbrush, or maybe not an old paintbrush, but a paintbrush that isn't uh, uh, too gummed up with paint, and brush off the dirt rather than wash them. If you wash them, well, you can uh, end up making them deteriorate quicker. Um, oh, but, faster, yeah. And, yeah, and then just cut off, you know, whatever parts of the stem might have uh, dirt and, and stuff attached to them. Or, okay or insect damage or anything like that yeah and one thing to watch out for the area that i told you about uh the area that was up french creek another reason we quit going up there is that you will run into other mushroomers and usually a pretty good calm group but sometimes you might go up somewhere like mountain loop highway uh and you'll run into people that have taken a beach uh picnic shelter and covered it all with blue tarps and you know they're living in there. You know that they're making a living by picking <laughs> mushrooms and selling them commercially. And I usually don't want to run into those people in the woods <laughs> for obvious reasons. My wife and I, again, a few years ago, we we're driving from uh, Granite Falls to Darrington on the Mountain Loop Highway, uh, finding some of our favorite sp places. And we round a corner and there was this young woman, 20-ish, wearing like a, a baby doll negligee and she was in the middle of the road and she had a big grin on her face and she was smiling and, and turning, in turning in circles. And I told my wife, I said, roll up your window. I'm gonna drive by real slow. I'm not stopping. Don't open the window, don't talk to her. As we rounded a corner, there was this one uh, guy leaning up against his car. He smiled and he made a motion like, I'm watching her. So you knew that she found mushrooms, but they weren't the mushrooms that we were looking for. <laughs> details yeah, oh yeah it was weird I'm weird yes okay so gotta be careful when you're out and about <laughs> okay do you awesome. know of any wildlife that likes mushrooms i know i saw a squirrel chomping on a oh they all like it. they all like them went, went down the sure. you'll find a lot of meeting them and mm -hmm. and there are you know there are places on camino um that you can find them uh, regular trails that everybody walks on in the state parks here. And if you're on Whidbey, you can find them Deception Pass State Park. Um, actually, if you go to some of the websites of some of those uh, mycological societies and you click on forays, they might have information you can see without being a member on where their foray is going to go on such and such a date. So you get a good inkling that that might be a good place to go and find them. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, thank, thank you so very much. Very informative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I hadn't done one of these presentations in a year and a half, and that was on a different topic, so uh, I was a little nervous. Uh, what, I, I, what about, you did a great job, Scott. What about the, uh, the, the comment that if, it's, if you see an animal eating, it's safe to eat? No. Um, <laughs> Different animals can eat different things and uh, have different experiences. You wouldn't feed your dog chocolate. You know that it can be real harmful to them, whereas we can eat it just fine. It's the same way uh, reciprocal. There are things that some other animals can eat that uh, we can't tolerate um, or wouldn't be able to eat. Because we all, well, like the ammonitas, the red ones with the white tops, as I showed, you know, reindeer eat them like crazy. Um, if you ate one, you could trip out, you could get really sick. <laughs> but uh, uh, just because some other animal has eaten them doesn't mean a thing. Okay, any other questions? 
Well, thank you so much, Scott. We really do appreciate it. Well, thank you. And, and you thank know you all for coming. Yeah, thanks. Take care. Happy Monday. See you Saturday. Well. See you Saturday. Okay. Good. I'll see you there. <laughs> bye bye. Good community bye. one. Come to that Saturday. Thank you, Scott. The, the, this isn't the same as when you cooked the mushrooms for us, the one one of our programs in person. Huh. And, you, and, and that's one thing I should say too, I should have mentioned cook any mushroom, try a little tiny, if it's a new one, try a tiny bit of it first to find out if you happen to have an allergen, um, you, you never know. And uh, if you're okay, then the next time you can eat a little bit more and the next time you can eat a little bit more, but cook all mushrooms because sometimes uh, they'll have toxins that will cook right out. And I, will, I don't even eat button mushrooms unless they're cooked. I know in the 70s, you know, you go to every salad bar and there's a big bowl of sliced fresh mushrooms um, because there are some, most mushrooms have some toxin to ward off insects and such. Um, so it's always good to make sure that they're cooked thoroughly. Good hint or good tip. Yeah, I'll think of a lot of other stuff I didn't say afterwards. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I remember you saying that, you know, in one of the other programs. It's, right. And I thought, oh, good that's a good point. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. We really appreciate it. Yep. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.